All right, Matthew chapter 10, a very famous chapter in a lot of ways. This is, this is one of the first mentions of where the Lord is beginning to tell us that we're going to go through tribulation. And he doesn't quite reveal as much information as he does like in Luke 17 or Luke 21 or Matthew 24. But this is a very important chapter. Jesus is trying to teach his disciples a lesson here. Look at verse number 24. Matthew 10 verse 24. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house, Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Right? He's saying, they called Jesus the devil or a Beelzebub. They said, well, how much more are they going to call you sons of the devil for following Jesus? Look at the next verse. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. He's saying, hey, what, what people don't know now, one day they will know, right? One day everybody will know the truth. And, you know, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And there were people that were alive at this time that were, that were cursing the disciples of Jesus Christ and falsely accusing them of things. And one day they will understand the truth. They will know what the truth was. You know, as a Christian, we have a duty to only fear God the Lord. And here Jesus is saying, if you're going to be my disciple, there's going to be people that will hate you because for my sake. There's going to be people that will falsely accuse you and persecute you and you will go through trials and tribulation. But it's our responsibility to make sure that we fear the Lord. We are not to fear them. As he says here, he says, fear them not. Right? He says, we're supposed to fear the Lord. And there is a big difference between faith and fear. And that's what the sermon's all about is those that have faith in God don't have to fear man. In fact, to have faith in God means that you actually fear the Lord. As a Christian, knowing that we will be rewarded for what we do while we're here, we ought to fear the Lord. As a Christian, knowing that we will be judged for sinning while we're on the earth, He will correct us and chastise us on the earth, we ought to fear the Lord. It's the Christian duty and responsibility to have victory over sin in the trials of life by making sure that we only fear the Lord. If we will fear Him, we have nothing else to fear. You know, here in Matthew 10, He, he gives us a glimpse into some of the end times. Again, He doesn't get as deep as He does in Matthew 24, but He talks about people drawing you before councils and things like this. And this is a clear you know, there much, there's much clear scripture about the end times that this, this will happen to Christians. And I was talking to a worldly person this week, and I, I, don't, I do not believe that they're actually a Christian, but they made this statement and they were fearful about how it's clear that we're in the end times. Well, if you just look at what's going on in the world, oh, it's obvious we're near the end times. And, you know, that makes sense because the Bible has told us there are many events that will take place. The world will be in chaos. There will be trials and tribulations and famine. And guess what? There's going to be a lot of people afraid as well. Sure. You know, in the book of Amos, it says, As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him. In the, in the days of tribulation, in the end of the world, it's like, I'm running from this lion. Uh-oh, I found a bear. Right? And this will happen not only in the end times, but also all throughout the Christian life. And it's our job as a Christian you know, to make sure that when we're tempted in these points or we're tried in certain areas of life, that we have victory by fearing the Lord. God wants us to learn to have confidence in Him and trust in Him, and then we will overcome our own fears. Listen, if you fear God Almighty and His judgment and you seek for His blessing, then you have no man to fear. You have no government to fear. You don't have to fear a lion or a snake or a pit bull or a gun. You only fear the Lord. And that's why he tells them here, fear not. He says, fear them not, therefore. He's saying there's many things in this world that, that the people that are unsaved, you know, it says that fear is an evident token of perdition. Well, thank God we won't go to perdition. Let's take a step back here. Look at verse number 16. You know, the rest of the world is afraid of being hurt. 
This guy I was talking to that understood the end times were coming, he was afraid because he knew in the end of the world we might get hurt. We might suffer. We might see loved ones get hurt. But as Christians, our soul is what matters the most. Right? And, and preaching the gospel to others. And if we go in that spirit and have that power and that victory, then we have nothing to fear. Amen. Look at verse number 16 here. He says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Can you imagine God sending a sheep through a pack of wolves? Well, there's no way that sheep will make it through. Those wolves obviously would kill that sheep. God says, no, I know what I'm doing. I'm sending you through. He says, you need to be wise. You need to be harmless and fear the Lord and you'll make it through. Look at verse 17. He says, but beware of men. For they will deliver you up unto the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sakes, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. So he says, look out for wolves, look out for men. Beware of men. Again, he's not saying be afraid of men. He's saying beware, be wise, be warned. Be harmless as you walk through these wolves. Verse 19. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. He's saying, hey, you don't have to prepare a speech when you're called before the court about your testimony for Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, through the power of His Holy Spirit, will speak through you. He says, for it, verse 20, is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. He says, hey, the Holy Spirit is going to speak through you. God's Holy Spirit will speak through you. You have nothing to fear. You know, in 1 John 4, he says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Listen, as a Christian, we need to not be afraid of the future. We need to trust in the Lord. We need to love the Lord and obey the Lord and just trust that by doing the right thing, the future He has for us is the right future. Where He leads us and guides us will be the right place. It is food that is convenient for us, right? It's what we need. It's not, it may not always be what we dreamed of or what we think we want. Oh no, I'm afraid if I, if I, I might miss out on some of these physical blessings. Listen, fear the Lord, search after spiritual things, and He will take care of the rest of the details. Flip ahead to verse number 26 here. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. Look, people today think they can get away with whatever they want. Well, I'm in charge. I can hide. I can, I can steal money and get away with it. Nobody will know. No, God knows. Well, I can go along with this sin and it's art. No, God knows. And everything will be exposed one day. Everybody will answer one day, one way to God. Look, you as a Christian, you will not lose your salvation and end up in hell. But if you have secret sin in your life and you think you can hide it from God, God will judge you openly. He will make sure that you get your just desserts. You will get exactly what you deserve. And God wants to chasten His people so that we will not be hypocrites. Look at verse 27. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Sometimes God gives you something that you're like, well, I don't know if I should say that. You want me to talk about who? The the mayor? You want me to say that the mayor's Stealing money or he's helping the councilman cover something up. How, but God, if I speak up, they'll kill me. They'll cut off my head. They'll burn my house down. Don't you know they're part of a secret society? No, God says, hey, you do what you're told. You think about John the Baptist. He called out Herod's sin with no fear. It cost him his life, but God's will was in it. God's will was in it. Prophecy was fulfilled. John the Baptist, still, he stood up, he spoke up, and God provided. You know, in Acts chapter eight of uh, uh, eighteen of Paul, it said, where the Lord came to him in a night vision, he said, "Be not afraid, but speak. Hold not thy peace." Sometimes God gives you something, and, and you just feel a burning. You feel like the Spirit is telling you, "You need to stand up. You need to speak up. Hey, you need to do it." 
You need to obey that if God has given you that. Because in the end times, you know, in the book of Daniel, it says that, that his people, the people that do know their God, they will be strong and they will do exploits. You understand when the Antichrist comes on the scene, the scene and everybody's like, wait a minute, who is, is this the Antichrist? Is this guy good? Is he bad? Is he the Messiah? It's up to Christians to be strong and to expose them as false prophets, to expose the heresy that everybody's wondering about. Only a man of God full of the Spirit of God is able to do such a thing. Look at verse number 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Flip ahead to Luke chapter 12. So he's saying... If you would just fear God, honestly, in your heart, fear God, you have nothing else to worry about. You don't have to worry about, will your rent be made? Will my job be there next week? Are my kids going to be safe and healthy? If you will fear God, He will protect your body and your soul and your life and your family and your household and your job. We need to get serious about being afraid of God and we need to seriously not fear anything else. Be not afraid of them. They don't have power over your soul. They don't have power over your life. God has a hedge of protection around you. You know, and this commandment to fear goes way back. This is what it's always been about. I mean, one of the Ten Commandments is to love the Lord thy God. And hey, love is a two-way street. I love Him because He first loved me, right? But I also fear Him because He will judge me. I fear Him. In Deuteronomy 6, He says... And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that He might preserve us alive as it is this day. Do you want to be preserved alive? Do you want good in your life? Then fear the Lord. Listen, the size of your faith is relevant to the size of your fear of the Lord. If you're afraid of man, then it shows that your faith in the Lord is very small. In Matthew 10 there, he had said, I, he said, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. There is division happening from the time of Jesus even to now. There is division happening and the Lord is in it. The Lord is allowing it and we don't need to be afraid of division. Look at Luke 12. This is a parallel passage. Verse number 1. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, be, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So there's a great crowd, and then he speaks to his disciples while the crowd is watching, and he says, look out, beware of the Pharisees. He says, look out, beware of hypocrisy, of the hypocrites. He's, he's warning about fake Christians, false prophets, false religions, and, he, and also here, there's this crowd here as well. Look at the next verse, verse 2. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Hold your place here in Luke 12 and go to Hebrews 11. So who is he saying? Is Jesus saying, don't fear the crowd? Is Jesus saying, don't fear the Pharisees, these false prophets? Is he saying, don't fear yet even the hypocrites, false brethren? Hey, how about all three? How about it doesn't matter who it is, as long as you're fearing the Lord, you have no one else to fear. And listen, that's really what this is all about. It's faith versus fear. What will you do? Because if you have faith in the Lord, then that means you're afraid of the Lord. If you obey the Lord, that's because you ought to be because you're afraid of the Lord. You need to make sure that you keep a short account with Him. And we have victory as a Christian by trusting in the Lord even to accomplish the impossible. The Christian life is a series of battles. There's ups, there's downs, there's defeats, there's victories, and through it all, God wants us to get have stronger faith in Him and stronger fear of Him. The more you fear the Lord, the more you love the Lord. I believe those go hand in hand. And, you know, the Lord loves us so much He wants to provide for us. And just as much as you want your children to be afraid to play in the street, it's because you love them and you don't want them to get ran over. You know, God is much the same way. He doesn't want us to meddle with sin and to try to cover our transgressions. He wants us to confess our faults, confess it to Him. He is faithful and just to forgive us. You have your place in Luke 12 and Hebrews 11. 
Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 23. Verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Wait, you hear that? He, they had faith. They weren't afraid of the king. Yeah, but you don't know. The king is the biggest king. You're talk, yeah, you're talking about the Pharaoh, right? They were not afraid of the Pharaoh. They were not afraid of the king. They were afraid of God. So they acted by faith. Skip ahead to verse 27. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Again, what, okay, go, to, go back to Luke chapter 20, tw uh, 12 for a second. Because his parents acted that way, his parents acted in faith, not fearing the king. When he grew up, he did the same thing. He acted in faith and he did not fear the king. He had nothing to worry about. You're in Luke chapter 12. Look at verse number 31. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock. Look at that in verse 32. Fear not, little flock. He's saying, look, if you're seeking for God, if you're doing what's right with God, you have nothing to be afraid of. And God says, hey, fear not, little flock. But we're just little. We're just a small group. What can God do with just a few people? Hey, there's a lot of stories in the Bible where God starts out with just a few people that were afraid of Him, that loved Him, that honored Him, and were willing to go to battle. And listen, that's what this is all about. It's either fear or faith. What will you do? Look at, let's read verse 32 again. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that you have. And give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. He's saying, don't be afraid of losing physical possessions. In fact, if you have a possession that you say, well, Lord, when the tribulation comes, I sure hope I don't lose, what, Grandma's clock? This old piano? Lord, I don't want to lose my gun collection whenever the tribulation comes. If you could help me keep that. Listen, it's your soul that matters. It's your family that matters. And if you're afraid of losing a physical possession, you ought to just go ahead and get rid of it. Amen. Lord, I got, I got this fancy phone. I hope I can have it all the way through the tribulation. Get rid of that thing. Go get you one of those bricks, one of those flip phones, right? Listen, anything that would get in the way of the Lord, you're not having faith in the Lord. We, we don't need to be covetous. People that are covetous, they're afraid of losing things. Yeah. They're scared to death, but I've invested so much time in this place, these walls, this building. Forget about it. Right. Quit fearing those things and fear the Lord. Amen. Verse 34, look what he says. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. How many, how many of you have visited a church where it's totally dead, the preaching is dead, there's no soul winning, but they have a fancy building. Right? Yeah. And why? There's people sitting in the pews, little old ladies that have given their tithe for 30 years to make sure this building will stand, and yet their Christian life is a disaster. It's a church in name only. They're not doing the work of the Lord. They're not learning the Bible. It's just a church in name only because they're worried about the building. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. A lot of these little old ladies will invite you to come to their building just so they can get more money to keep the building alive. It's not the way it ought to be. That wasn't God's plan for church. Look at verse 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Go back to Hebrews 11. What's he saying? Be ready. Your loins girded about. Have your belt on. Have your flashlight ready. Have your lights burning. And he's talking spiritually speaking here. We as born again, Bible believing Christians, when you have the Word of God in your heart and you're able to give the Gospel to any stranger, let that light be burning. doesn't matter who it is. Well, my boss is going to think I'm weird. He might not consider me for that raise if I tell him he's on his way to hell. Who are you afraid of? The boss or God? Listen, Moses was blessed because he was not afraid of the king. Make sure you don't let people get in the way of your fear of the Lord. You're in Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse 32. And what 
shall I more say. For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, and David also, and of Samuel, and of the prophets. So here he's saying, hey, who are some people that acted in faith? You know, chapter 11 in Hebrews is known as the faith chapter. But everywhere you see, this man had faith, so he did something. This man was moved by fear, so he did something, right? And that fear and faith go hand in hand here. So he's giving us a list of some heroes in the Bible. And he starts with Gideon. He says in verse 33, Who, through faith, subdued kingdoms. How, how did Gideon subdue a kingdom? Did he do it by his own strength? By his own sword? Well, it was the sword of the Lord and of Gideon that subdued a kingdom because Gideon had faith in the sword of the Lord. Look, he says, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Look at verse 34. Quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. You can lose your place there and go to Judges chapter 6. Go to Judges chapter 6. We're going to look at Gideon. But here he says that there was kingdoms conquered. I love this in verse 34. He says, quench the violence of fire. Well, I thought only water could quench the violence of fire. No, according to Hebrews, faith can quench the violence of fire. Well, what if there's a forest fire coming? Can I pray to God and He can protect just my house? Yes, He can. What about the, 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 uh, in, the, in Daniel, the book of Daniel? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace and they prayed unto the Lord and they said, hey, we're not afraid, king. And yet, if the Lord doesn't want to preserve us, that's okay. We're ready to die. right? Hey, I know where I'm going when I die. Amen. I was on a job site one time and there was a, a very shifty ladder situation we're on like a third or a fourth floor and i'm on an extension ladder that went up a full almost um i believe it was reaching about 30 foot and it was leaning on a rafter and there wasn't anything to properly secure it and i'm working with a bunch of millwrights and roughnecks and i mean we put screws in front of the ladder feet and we had two men trying to hold the ladder and 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 nobody wanted to climb it they were afraid but we've got to get up there we've got to get that shackle down who will go? And I said, hey, I know where I'm going. Well, now you, well, wait, you're, it doesn't matter. I know where I'm going. If I fall, I know I'm ready to go to heaven. I don't care. Lord, help me. And I climbed that ladder, praying on every step. Lord, get me up this ladder. Lord, get me to the roof. Lord, help me untie this thing while I still hold on. And the Lord preserved me. Right? As Christians, and listen, I'm not telling you to go do stupid stunts and try to glorify God or hey I play I play football but I put John 3:16 under my eye look that's not the same thing right <laughs> what I'm saying is when when you are crossing the paths of situations and trials in life if you're afraid of the Lord you have absolutely nothing nothing at all to fear if you're literally confronted with a lion understand David as a child was able to overcome a lion Others were able to walk past lions without dying. Daniel, the same thing, overcame lions just by faith, just because they feared the Lord. In Psalm 56, he says, In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. You're in Judges chapter 6. We're going to take a glimpse here at the story of Gideon. Verse number 7. And it came to pass... When the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. Now listen, people have, I've heard my whole life that God, God only talks to you through the Bible, but right here we see people, men of God, children of God, women of God, praying to the Lord, and God sends a prophet also. So I do believe that the Lord will talk to us through the Bible, but also through a prophet. Right? They cried unto the Lord, and the Lord sends them a prophet. Then, of course, that prophet gives them the word of the Lord. He preaches the word of the Lord unto them, but sometimes God answers prayer by sending men to confirm things, to help you overcome your fear. Verse 9, he says, And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drave them out from before you, and gave you their land. 
And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Right? So they're oppressed. They pray unto the Lord. They cry unto the Lord. God sends them a prophet that says, don't you remember what He's already done? Don't you remember what He's already said? You need to fear the Lord and stop fearing these false gods. So this prophet comes back and reminds them what they were already told. He reconfirms things that they should have already known. But they're in sin here. The whole nation is in sin. The whole nation is being oppressed because they are fearing false gods. They're afraid of false gods. They're probably superstitious. Well, I guess we better go ahead and... I mean, we don't want to upset the people that like Baal, so we'll put one a Baal statue in here also. right? They're so worried about not upsetting false gods that they end up sinning to the real God, the one true God, by honoring and worshiping a false god. Look, the Christian life is a series of battles and victories. Some of these battles, the test is to see whether you will compromise and give in to Baal and give in to the devil and just let a little bit of leaven come in. Well, I mean, I guess we'll just... They're my family. We'll let them bring some alcohol in at Christmas. Look, don't compromise. Do not compromise. Stand your ground. You have nothing to fear if you fear the Lord. Look at verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Ophrah that pertained to Joash the Abizurite and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So again, he's in fear. right? This guy is afraid of being found out and losing his crop. Look what he says, verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. So the Lord confirms him. Listen, the, we're not going to have an angel come to us. You need to find that kind of statement in the Bible. You need to see that the angel of the Lord will support you and, and help you. And here he comes to Gideon. He's like, hey, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Can you imagine that? Who am I? Who, calling me a mighty man of valor? Can you imagine? I mean, so he's already in fear because they're oppressed and they're occupied by the enemy. He's trying to hide his crops just to preserve the, the life here. But God sees that he's a hard worker and a humble person, and he's willing, he fears the Lord, so he comes to him. Look at verse 13. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So he's saying, if, if we're so blessed by God, why are we oppressed by the enemy? Now, of course, the nation was in sin. They had to get it right. They needed that prophet to begin and say, Prepare the way of the Lord. And guess what? God was getting the next man ready to lay a foundation. Look at verse 14. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? He's saying, I know you're strong enough to make it through this. I know you're able to do this. That's why I'm sending you. Look, God will get the glory in this story. God is coming to glorify His name and His word in this entire nation. But He does it by picking a man and saying, You are strong enough to get through all this. Listen, men, as leaders in your house, you must lead the house on your own strength. And your strength is in the Lord. Your fear ought to be in the Lord. Look at verse 15. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewithal shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. He's trying to teach him, have confidence in God, not in man. He's saying, have confidence that your brethren will fight with you as one man. In Psalm 37, he says, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Listen, as Christians, a lot of times, we're so worried about what's going to happen. We're so worried about what the future holds or what mankind will do unto us. And God wants us to have confidence in the Lord alone. But Lord, will it all work out? But Lord, how's the future look? He says, hey, work with the now. Trust Him now, immediately. Only fear the Lord, and He will provide everything you need. Look at verse number 22. 
And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O my Lord, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. He's saying, hey, I'm afraid. This is God. Once this miracle happens, and you know, the, the, it, we skip part of the story here where he brings out bread and meat and the angel causes it to catch on fire and he disappears. Immediately, Gideon's like, this was God. He's afraid of God. You can tell, right, where his heart is at in that he wants to serve God. He wants to be afraid of God. So he's alas, Lord, right? Because he, he saw him face to face. And he says, and the Lord said unto him, verse 23, peace be unto thee, Fear not, thou shalt not die. He's saying, don't worry, they're not going to kill you. Don't worry, I'm not going to kill you. Don't worry, you not only will get through this, you're going to lead a major victory for God's people. The next few verses, he's told to throw down the altar of Baal and to cut down that grove. Look at verse 27. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, listen, because he feared his father's household, and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. Look, so here's Gideon. He's gotten rid of the fear. I fear the Lord, right? God says, fear not. And what's he do? Well, I'm a little bit afraid of my father's household. Again, this is the Christian life. It's a back and a forth. I'm afraid. I know God will provide. I'm still going to go. Right? So he goes at night. Look at the next verse. Verse 28, it says, And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down. And the grove was cut down that was by it. And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. So what happens? So he destroys it. He does what the Lord says. He gets through his fear. He fights through it. Even though he's afraid of his father, he's still more afraid of the Lord God Almighty. So he does what God says. He obeys. He cuts down Baal. They actually rename him. They call Gideon Jerubabel, which means let Baal plead for him. Because they come looking for him. Let's go find Gideon if he did this. And they say, well, let Baal go get him. Hey, if there's a problem with him, send Baal. If Baal's a god, let Baal defend himself is what they say. And that's the nickname that Gideon gets because he conquered their false god. Imagine that the whole land is given to idolatry and this false god, and now here's Gideon that God is trying to elevate, overcoming his fears, and they give him a nickname as a god slayer, if you will. Lowercase g. He destroyed Baal. Look at verse 33. Then the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet. And Abiezar was gathered after him. So here he begins to gather together the people. The enemy's coming. War is ready. Right? The Spirit of the Lord falls upon Gideon. He blows the trumpet. Here come the people. Look at verse. Look at the next chapter, chapter number seven, verse number two. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. God says, hey, you got a lot of people gathered together to go to fight, but they're going to take the credit and not glorify me. He says, I don't want all of this crowd to vaunt themselves and say, we did it on our own. God says, I want the glory in this. I'm giving the victory in this. Let's send some people home. Right? Look at the next verse. Actually, skip ahead to verse 6, where he tells them the people are too many. Verse 6, he says, And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But at the first, but the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. He says, I'm gonna, God said, I'm going to give you a way to test the people. Those that pick up water with their hand and drink it out of their hand. He says, those are the people I want. The ones that just get down on their knees and bow down to the water and drink out of it. He says, send them home. Right? Because there's... Too many people. I'm sorry. Let me back up here. Let's go back to verse number 3. First, he sends them the, the volunteers home. Judges chapter 7, verse number 3 he says, Now therefore, go to them, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from the Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. Right? So he starts with thirty two thousand. He says, If you're afraid, go home. Immediately two thirds leave. Immediately the majority of the crowd just departs and says, Well, we don't want to oh, I'm not I don't want to go fight these people. We're gonna lose. We're in bondage. We're oppressed by them. We're occupied by them. They were in 
fear, not in the spirit of the Lord, right? They were not in the fear of the Lord. They were in the fear of the Midianites. So God said, well, I don't want you anyway. So then of the remaining 10,000, he gives Gideon this test because he says, yet yeah, there are too many people. And this test that we see in verse 6 is those that lap the water with their hand versus those that bow down on their knees and drink it that way. So God, from that, reduces it from 32,000 to 300 men. Now look at verse 9. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down into the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Phura thy servant, go down to the host. Now, now God here has just helped Gideon overcome fear several times in his life. He has encouraged him. He has said, you're a mighty man of valor. He said, I've delivered them into your hand. He has fulfilled prophecy. He has allowed Gideon to ask questions and ask for proof. And God has proved him through miracles, saying, this is of me. I will deliver the enemy. And yet here he is. Now it's time. You know, this is a multitude so great. And you got 300 people. And Gideon's with 300 people. And the Lord says, but if thou fear... So God being long-suffering and patient with us, He says, let me prove me myself one more time to you. Let me encourage you one more time before I send you into battle. See, God knows man, that man is weak. And there are times throughout our Christian life we will have ups and downs, and God is right there with us to prove us, to prove Himself to us, and to help us have victory over the situation. He does that with, with Gideon. He, he, he gives him this sign. Look at verse number 12. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. Talking about an innumerable number of enemies. Verse 13, And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay alone. So one guy's talking to another guy. He sees bread come in. It knocks over the tent. Verse 14. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. Look, God was using these trials. God was using the fear of His own father's household to tear down Baal. And when He overcame that, His reputation spread. These people knew who Gideon was. They knew who His father was. They probably knew the story that this was Jerubbaal, right? The Baal slayer. The false god slayer that God was using to elevate. That God was helping him overcome his fears to establish a righteous nation. So he has his 300 men here. But Gideon hears this. He's outside the tent with, his, with one man. He's in the midst of the enemy and he hears this prophecy. He hears this dream being interpreted. Look at his response in verse 15. And it was so, when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped. Paul's right there. He worshipped. Wait, he's in the middle of the enemy's camp. Isn't he afraid they're going to find him? Isn't he afraid if he just stops to worship God in the midst of all this that he's going to lose his footing, he's going to lose his life, he's going to lose the battle? No, at this point, I think, I think all of Gideon's fears had been dissolved. When he hears the dream and the interpretation after the Lord had sent him down here, he says, this is of the Lord. He took time, he stopped, and he worshipped in the midst of all of this chaos that was about to happen. Look, he says, and he picks up from there, he says, worshipped and returned unto the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. So we know the story. I want you to go to 1 Samuel chapter 12, and we'll be done this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 12. We know the story. Those 300 men went forth. They had trumpets in their right hand. They had a pitcher and a candle. They break their pitcher. They're holding the candles up. They blow their trumpets, and they holler, you know, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And it said that God made the enemy so afraid that they turned around and they fought each other. And even those that escaped were chased down 
and eliminated, and God had victory from just 300 men. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Listen, God's people gave the Lord credit. God's enemies were afraid of the man that God had sent. And of course, what did the angel say to him? Thou mighty man of valor. He said, go in thy might. It was up to Gideon as a man. Hey, I'm strong enough to get through this. God's given me a task to do. Will I complete it? Will I do it? Or am I going to stop and be afraid? Am I going to hide from the enemy? Or will I go in the might that the Lord has given me and go in the Spirit of the Lord and blow that trumpet and call for the people to come? What an awesome story here because then he uses the trumpet again, obviously, to defeat the enemy with just a trumpet. They didn't go with swords. They didn't go with staves. They didn't throw rocks. They just stood still and watched the Lord have victory. And sometimes in the Christian life, you know, that is our faith growing through the fear of the Lord is learning when to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. That's good. When to stand still and watch Him provide all these victories. You're in 1 Samuel 12. Before we start there, let me read Proverbs 29. It says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. There's a promise from God. You put your trust in God, you will be safe from man. If you're afraid of man, it's like a snare. It's like a trap. If you're afraid of man, you're not afraid of God. You're not having faith in God. And you will stumble in that trap. You will die from your fear of man. But if your trust is in the Lord, and you fear the Lord, you have nothing to fear on this earth. You're in 1 Samuel chapter 12. Look at verse number 6. And Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron, and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Let me just remind you, don't fear your boss, don't fear your clients, don't fear your jobs, fear the Lord. It is the Lord that gives you raises, it is the Lord that advances you, and it is the Lord that will provide and protect for you. Verse 7, he says, Now therefore, stand still, that I may reason with you before the Lord all the righteous acts of the Lord, which He did to you and to your fathers. When Jacob was come into Egypt, listen to this, and your fathers cried unto the Lord. Then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron. Remember we saw this in the past, in the last passage here where the people cried unto the Lord. God's people are praying and asking the Lord for deliverance. So God sends a prophet. God sends a preacher. God sends a deliverer to provide for the safety of His people. Look at verse number 10. And they cried unto the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies and we will serve thee. And the Lord sent Jerubbabel. Right? There's Gideon. So here we have Samuel reminding the people as he's about to institute their first king. Don't you remember what happened with Gideon? Don't you remember the great victories that you've had in the past? He says, And the Lord sent Jerubbabel and Bedan, and Jephthah, and Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwelt safe. And when you saw that Nasha, king of the children of Amma, came against you, you said unto me, Nay, but a king will reign over us. And the Lord your God was your king. He's saying, look, God was taking care of you, and you didn't think it was good enough. You looked at the other nations. You said, they have a king. Can't we have a king just like them? He said, God was your king. God was your leader, your provider, and your protector. And that's the way it ought to be. Again, prayer was made for deliverance. God sends a prophet. Now the prophet has certain responsibilities to the people. Here he's reminding them of the past victories. He's rebuking them for their sin. But he's also praying for them for their future. Look at verse 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord and ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good in the right way. Listen, fathers, you're the head of your household. This is a responsibility you have. You need to rebuke the sin in your house. You need to be praying for them. You need to be leading by example. You need to be studying your Bible so you can teach others. Look at what he says in verse 24. Only... Fear the Lord. That says, no Baal, no man, don't fear your wife, don't fear your parents, only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth 
with all your heart. For consider how great things He hath done for you. But if ye shall do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. As Samuel's given him a king, he's given him warning also. Listen, remember, remember Gideon? Remember Jerubbabel that conquered the gods? That God used him as a mighty man of valor? Listen, it's fear or faith. Have faith in God. Don't fear the world. In Luke 12, he says, But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure. It's God's pleasure that we would be prosperous and thrive and go out and preach the gospel and continue to grow. Amen. Look around you. God is prospering us. God is protecting us. And He's telling us right now, fear not, little flock. Hey, fear God, but don't fear any man. Fear them not, therefore. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for this great story about Gideon. Lord, thank You for the words that You taught Your disciples while they're surrounded by the false accusers, by the Pharisees, by the multitude, by hypocrisy, Lord. And You told them to fear not. You said they're going to draw you up, but fear not. The Lord will give us the words that we need. Lord, we love You. We thank You for Your Word. Lord, I pray You bless the soul winning this afternoon. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.